When you play the Game of Thrones, you subscribe and like. Or you die. There is no middle ground. All right, hello YouTube. Welcome back to the Reese Cobb YouTube channel. Today's video, we're gonna be continuing on our Game of Thrones reread, and we're gonna be doing Catelyn Nine. Yeah, we're getting pretty deep in there. I know there's a certain man out there that's really excited for the Battle of the Green Fork, and we're getting close. But we are at the twins, the dreaded tw twins. This chapter to me is a great chapter because it doesn't really fully resolve itself. We don't get a lot of the payoffs for this chapter until way later on in book three with the Red Wedding, but all the seeds of that event are planted here. We get exactly what Walder Frey is going to do later on here. It's all planted in the mind here. And so, really enjoy this chapter. Let's get into it, not waste any time. And we are going to be starting on page 638. So the opening is a bleak one. Again, they're still departing from the causeway and going into the Riverlands. Every step made her fear more and more, and made her more anxious. Again, think about this. The further down south, the more locked into this conflict you are, right? At Moat Caitlin, you were still in a situation where you could stay in the north, you could just play a defensive war, a much safer war for yourself. But the issue becomes, as you go farther down south, it becomes more real. Catelyn starts to realize this, that her son could die. Also, we know the news of the Riverlands and what's happening here. The pure Catelyn's people, she is from the Riverlands, are being killed or being imprisoned or attacked, put to the sword. It's a really bleak time for Catelyn, as well as her husband being captured. Who knows what's going to happen to him for her at this point. But we also see what Catelyn will try to do for pretty much her entire story is putting on a strong face, not letting any of this show because she knows that she needs to be strong for Rob. She has to be his anchor in this, this emotional time at this time. But she knows it was worse at night. At night... She could either barely sleep because a lot of these things going on in her mind, or if she did, she would dream of other things or think about other things. Very similar to Ned, right? If you think about Ned, he talks about this a lot in his chapter where he struggled with sleeping. When he slept, he dreamt of other things like broken promises and things like that. Very similar with Catelyn. She's also fearful to see any of these ravens flying by sending messages because any of these messages could bring her word that Sansa is dead, Arya is dead, uh, Ned is dead, her brother Edmure is dead, River Run's been taken. All of these things could really be bad for her. And I think at this time, no news is better news than getting news. Now, a lot of the times we know these ravens are actually going to be like scouting reports or things like that, but they are information from what's going on in the world as well. But at this time, she thinks of her family, Ned and Edmure, her daughters, her sons at Winterfell. She feared for them, but there was nothing she could do for them. She had to put all of her strength into Rob. She must be a Stark now, like her son. Again, it's Catelyn just playing this role of being a strong motherhood, strong mother figure and trying to help Rob as best as she can. Because Rob really is the key to any type of Stark success or getting out of this with their family still somewhat intact. Again, like we talked about their plan. If Rob can make this war go somewhat well or give it to be it's a pain in the ass enough for the Lannisters to sue for peace, she can hopefully maybe get her daughters back and maybe even Ned, and maybe there can be a peace that is settled here. He notes that Rob rode at the front of the army, and every day he supped with a new lord as to not show favorites and to seek their counsel and to weigh their advice against another's. Catelyn was proud of him once again and how much he had learned from Ned, but would it be enough? Now, there's a lot here, right? It shows that Rob is becoming that leader. All these things that's been hinted out from Bran's POVs that are now kind of going into Catelyn's POVs, Rob is growing up. He's learning how to be a man, how to be someone that all these people can respect, and as well as a little bit fear as well. And he's learning how to be wiser, smarter, just taking in all this knowledge of all these people that have been lords for a very long time at this point, or maybe some that haven't been such a long time as a lord, but still understanding what their counsel is and what their motivations are. It's going to help you better utilize these men. When we think about what this plan is, because he knows who his men are, it's allowing him to make better decisions. Allowing Roose Bolton to be in charge of his foot when they go to attack basically Tywin, is smart because he knows that Roos is a cautious man. And so you see a lot of that working into Rob's mind at this point. But yeah, just another proud moment from Catelyn seeing her son grow up and be a very respectable man, leading so many men. That gets us into page 639. 
She notes that Blackfish had taken 100 men and that he had that he had selected in 100 horses and had been screening their movements, but the reports were not as great. Again, there's a lot of things going against Rob's campaign right now, but something we, again, we see is very smart from Rob is he's letting Blackfish do what he needs to do. Blackfish is allowing so no one knows where their movements are, and if they do come across any spies, they don't get to report back to Tywin or whoever. Right now, Rob is a ghost. They're, Tywin is hearing very vague rumors of what's going on. They're heading south, but where south that's all he knows and so when they do this split it's very easy to understand why rob is able to make it to river run almost completely undetected because of this there's no messages that are going to be being sent because all the ravens are being shot down there's no outriders or scouts making it out of the blackfish's net and so that is why this is so important and why i think in the book specifically we attribute a lot more of rob's success also to the blackfish whereas the show we didn't really see that, right? That wasn't a huge thing. Now, it was still an element of the show, but it wasn't as big of an element as it is here in the book. But let's look at three reports. Walder Frey had amassed 4,000 men at the Twins. Again, interesting, given he's not protecting really much of his land, and he's garnering all his men for basically somewhat, it seems like a siege. But Tywin also was still many days to the south. But Callan also murmurs how he's still late, the late Lord Frey. Again, Walder Frey should be with Edmure. You would think, right? This is your liege lord. The Tullys are under attack by the Lannisters. You would assume the Freys would go to help him. Now, Walder's going to have his own explanation. We'll talk about a little bit later on. But it does, again, show that Walder is not maybe as loyal as all these other bannermen are that we've seen in the north. And it's a great contrast because we go from the north where we see everyone kind of rallied around Rob. Now, Rob did have to earn the respect and things like that, but everybody really is behind the Starks. That's not the case with the Riverlands, and that's something I think is very interesting to look at, and I really find Walder Frey to be a fascinating character, especially in this chapter, as we get a lot of his personality in this one. Rob thinks this means that Walder means to join their, his forces to their own, as he cannot hope to defeat the Lannisters on his own, and Rob is still very young. Rob doesn't know who Walder Frey is, he's never met him, doesn't know a lot about him at this point. And so, from if you're looking at this point of view from what Rob has experienced in the North, you might, you're might thinking, oh... Walder Frey is just going to, you know, blend his forces to us, we're going to cross, and we're going to go help River Run. That's not the case. That's not who Walder Frey is as a man. And so, it again shows that, yes, as Rob is getting older, he's still naive and a bit young, and Catelyn is less certain, and she says, expect nothing and you won't be surprised. Again, ironic given what happens at the Red Wedding, right? It, very ironic. Now, that isn't to say that Catelyn you know, wasn't expecting some sort of hostility going to the twins, but it is still ironic given what their fate of ends up being. Rob notes that, well, there's a Tully Bannerman, but Catelyn notes that some men take their vows less seriously than others. But I also think about it from this POV, right? Like, if we go back to Robert's Rebellion, and we think about Stannis, Stannis was put into a situation where, okay, how do you follow the law? There really is no answer. Because you swore a vow to your king, but you also swore a vow to your, the Baratheons and your brother. So, how do you exactly navigate that situation? It's the, again, it goes back to the classic Jamie talk about oaths. A lot of the times, they conflict each other. And so, in a lot of ways, if you can kind of take a step back, knowing that we like the Starks, and we like the Tullys. They're the, you know, the good guys in this story. You can understand why Walder Frey stays out of this. Because in a lot of ways, he also has an oath to the king. So, it's a really muddy idea here that's, that's important to understand. Because you also have to think about Walder Frey has the weight on his shoulders. That if he picks the wrong decision or he picks the wrong side, he gets pretty much everybody killed. Now, I don't think he cares as much about that. But it's more about personal gain, and so we'll talk about it a little bit later on as well. But I also find this is really great foreshadowing to characters later on that we're going to see with Jamie and Stannis, and we kind of uncover their backstories a bit. I just find this is a nice little stepping stone to kind of talk about that that talk about that idea here. She also notes how the Freys have always been a little too close to the Lannisters, as one of his sons is married to a Lannister, one that we will not really meet until Book Four, unfortunately. But, yeah, that's another point, right, is that Walder Frey and the Freys as a whole do have some ties to the Lannisters as well. And so if you're thinking about this from Walder's point of view, of just kind of, maybe not even Walder's point of view, but looking into Walder's camp, they're not married into the Tullys. 
they're not married into like a lot of these big river lord you know houses but they are to the lannisters it does kind of paint that picture it's like yeah the river lords really don't give too much of a shit about the phrase even though the phrase are a very powerful house in the riverlands it's very curious when you look at that from that point of view and again this is a little bit of me trying to humanize the phrase a bit more because i think the way that they are described, the way they are set as the villains, kind of from the get-go, I want to humanize them a little bit, kind of understand why they do the things they do. Robet Glover asks if she thinks he means to betray them, and Callan notes she is unsure if even Walder Frey knows what he is going to do yet. I think that's a great point, right? Because Catelyn notes he has an old man's caution, but a young man's ambition. He has always been cunning. A great line for Walder Frey, right? He wants more power. He wants more things, but he's also very cautious. He's not going to do something unless he has the support of someone else, or he thinks it's going to be to his benefit and there's a chance that they could win. And so you look at that and you go, hmm, that's an interesting character to build upon. But also, we already have this idea that Walder Frey would betray them, right? Already front and center showing us more of the red wedding and i again it's why i love the red wedding so much is because we get so much foreshadowing we get so much on the nose like oh yeah this could possibly happen right here in book one but at this rob cuts in saying we need the phrase that is the only way to cross the river and rob is right like there is no other option if if rob cannot get the twins to join him or at least allow him to pass they are screwed. That gets into page 640. Catelyn smartly notes, but so does Walder Frey. Again, Walder knows that he has to have this bridge. So you're kind of in a weird situation where Walder has a lot of leverage because without his crossing, the Starks are screwed. But at the same time, he almost doesn't have leverage as well because in this situation, if he doesn't just straight up side with the Lannisters, he gets nothing really out of it. And so that's something I find very interesting with the negotiating phase of the end of this, which we don't really see much. We get kind of the end result of what happens with the negotiation. There's a little bit of leverage on both sides that I find very curious that makes this negotiation that we're going to see very interesting. But they make camp for the night, but Theon brings news from the Blackfish. They just cross swords with some Lannister outriders from Adam Marbrand, but they won't be reporting anytime soon. But he does note that Adam knows more or less where they are, but will not know when they split. Again, kind of just goes back to what Tywin's plan was. Tywin's plan was more or less to harass their baggage, just try to harass them, provoke them to come further south, but do not engage them. And so kind of seeing how that plan's panning out, how the Blackfish is dealing with that. Talon suggests, unless Walder tells them on them, on them yeah, Walder could easily say, oh, yeah, they're trying to split here or this or that. He could easily break Rob's plan. And so you need to make sure he doesn't do that. But Theon basically says that they've already been doing that, right? Blackfish has been shooting down all the ravens coming from the twins. And again, just Theon being very cocky. But Catelyn thinks how, of course, her uncle was two steps ahead of her. Again, Blackfish is a war veteran. He's very smart. He's very tactical. Doesn't really need Catelyn's advice on warfare, in my opinion. But Catelyn does ask, what of the Freymen? What have they been doing as their fields are burned and plundered? And Theon notes there have been some fighting. They found two Lannister scouts hung, but most of the st strength remains at the Twins. And again, I think this is just showing this difference. That it's one thing to fully side with one side or the other. It's another thing to defend your own land. And that's what Catelyn's going to kind of note here is that Walder is playing the stay out of a game but he is willing to do things when forced to act. I also think it's actually quite stupid. If you're the Lannisters, why would you attack the twins at all? The twins have not really done anything to pick a side yet, and so you would think you'd want to be very peaceful with them, trying to get them to your side. Doesn't seem the way that this is going at this point if you're burning their lands. But Rob takes this as an encouraging sign, and as maybe that means Walder means to hold to his vows since he is, a fighting, since he is fighting Lannister men. But again, Catelyn talks about what I talked about, right? Where it's just really him defending his own land. That's way different than meeting Tywin in an open battle. But Rob, looking for another way out, asks if Blackfish had found any other way to across the river, to which there is little hope. As Blackfish had said, the Green Fork is running too high and fast. It cannot be forded this far north. Nailing down the fact that Rob needs to get this bridge, there's no way of crossing it. 
And that's a kind of a double-edged sword, right? Because on one side of it, it tells you, oh yeah, well, Tywin's not gonna be able to cross either. So, you know, you're getting what you pay for and really in that regard, but that gets us into page 641. Rob is losing a bit of his patience and says he must have that crossing. The horses may be able to ford the rivers, but not with armored men on their backs. We have no time to build rafts, and Tywin is marching north as he balls up his fists. Again, time is running short for Rob. Rob doesn't have time to do a siege, to try and make a safe crossing of the river. He has to move swiftly, or Tywin will catch him in the rear. The Theon notes that Walder would be a fool to oppose them, as they have five times his numbers. They could take the castle if need be. But this is not true. Um, first of all, yes, maybe the Starks could take the castle. That part of it, okay. But think about the casualties you would lose. Think about the time that it would take, right, to try and siege this castle. In terms of building siege equipment, things like that, it would take too long, right? They would be found out, and they would be just pinched between Jamie and Tywin. It's not a good move, right? So... In this regard, you have three options. One option is you flee to Mo Kalen. Two is you make peace with Tywin or go to open battle with Tywin. Three, you go to Walder Frey and, you know, either try to take it or, you know, make peace, whatever, and lie in your bed. Or you don't have many options here. And that's exactly what Catelyn says, right? What I just said is basically what she does. And she, again, appears as the voice of reason in this council. And something we see a lot with Catelyn is when she's just not the focus of what's going on and she's very logical and rob looked from her to theon again looking for an answer and not finding one he looked even younger than 15 with he looked even younger than his age even with his armor and facial hair growing he asked what father would do and she says find a way across whatever the cost again foreshadowing to what will come with this negotiation but the next morning, they were greeted by Blackfish, who was no longer in the heavy plate of the veil and of all well, that was going on there, but light armor for an outrider position. Again, you're prioritizing speed. You're prioritizing stealth. You don't really need heavy plate. You're not going into huge battles. He brings news of the battle under River Run, the one we learned about in the last Tyrion chapter. Again, Edmure has lost the battle, and Jaime has scattered the River Lords. This is a crippling blow to Rob's campaign, right? Because you're sitting here going, now we're not even going to really help Edmir in support of him. We're going to free him. The River Lords have lost. The battle is all but over, right? At this point, all that's left is River Run under siege. But interestingly, we get another quote about something cold growing in Kat's heart. More foreshadowing as to later, as she thinks a cold hand clutched at her heart. Again, very interesting that this comes right before the twins as well. Just again, showing that inner part of Stoneheart. But you have to think, right? Her brother just got captured. You know, her home is under siege. There's a lot of stress that she's going under right now. But she asks about her brother, and Blackfish notes, notes he is wounded and a prisoner, and Lord Blackwood and the other lords have, are sieged in River Run. Rob, even more stressed, says, We must get across this accursed bridge if they have any hope of relieving them. But this is not as easily done as Walder Frey had pulled back all his men and barred the gates of the twins. Again, and not a good omen for Rob's campaign. It just shows that Walder Frey is preparing for the inevitable, that there could be some sort of siege or battle going on for his castle. But not only that, you have to think about it from this point of view. Rob's cause doesn't look as great at this point. So trying to convince someone like Walder Frey to join him is not as good of a prospect as it maybe was before. But at this, Rob loses his cool even further, damning the man as if and if he will and if he has to storm the castle, he will, and sees how he likes that instead. But Catelyn again is logical. She understands what's going on. Catelyn says he's being a sulky boy, which is correct. But it is understandable, given Rob's dire situation. Rob doesn't have much left that he can do, right? The, the war's not going that particularly well, and we haven't even fought a battle yet for Rob. But she gives some great advice. Instead of wanting to tear something down, when he doesn't get his way, to use words, something that accomplish more than swords. Again, very ironic, given that Rob's whole campaign gets undone with words. This is some advice that someone like Joffrey would never get. And this really paints why I think a lot of people like Catelyn. I think Catelyn has her moments of being an incredibly wise character. 
And to me, it's, I think, to me, why she is so human and why I find her to be one of the best written characters that George has made in this series because she is someone that, on a fundamental level, can be very wise. She's someone that can give great advice. She can be a good mother at times, but she can also be a bad mother at times. She can make mistakes. She can be someone that doesn't think. But then at other times, Catelyn can be someone that makes very irrational decisions based off of emotion and things like that. So I think this that's what I think makes this character so interesting to me, that she is just someone that, at times, really smart. At other times, not so smart. But Rob seems to be embarrassed by this. Again, his mother kind of putting him in his place once again. But Catelyn talks about how the Freys had held the crossing for 600 years and have always exacted their toll. And Rob seems puzzled by this, asking what toll and what if I will not pay it? Catelyn notes, we shall see what the toll is. And if you don't, well, you might want to reconsider your options. But I want to think about that for a second. We talk about the Freys and how they've become a pretty powerful house. Like, commanding 4,000 men is a very sizable host. I mean, think about it right now. It's said that Rob has about 20,000 men. That's 20% of his army that the Freys have, and they're only one house in the Riverlands. That tells you how powerful they are just in relative terms of just being a singular house that can control a decent amount of men. And so you think about this geographical position that they have, they can control an entire way of passage. It's really interesting to think about before the conquest. So if we go back, you know, 300 years before Aegon came, when there were all these kings, when there were so much issues, not a lot of laws in Westeros, it was a much more barbaric area. They would have been able to grow in power quite a lot because of this toll. But Catelyn lets him think on this, but she thinks of Ned, and if he taught Rob wisdom, as some men need to know how to kneel, and so many men have died not knowing that lesson. And this is so fascinating, given the fact that Ned is in this exact position that Catelyn's thinking about. Ned is in a position where he's being given an option. One, to die, right, of course. But the other option is to live on, but giving up his pride, his honor, his loyalties, his ethics in a lot of ways, to save himself, but also Sansa. Does he have the capabilities to do that? And that's what Catelyn's talking about here. And so Catelyn connects the story with Rob with his father, Ned. I love this writing. It's some of my favorite of book one. I think book one has a lot of underrated writing moments that we tend to forget about. And I think this is one of those moments. But at this point, I want to end out the page and begin the next page with a description of the twins. It was near midday when their vanguard came in sight of the twins, where the Lords of the Crossing had their seat. The Green Fork ran swift and deep here, but the phrase had spanned it many centuries past and grown rich off the coin men paid them to cross. The bridge was a massive arch of smooth gray rock, wide enough for two wagons to pass abreast. The water tower rose from the center of the span, commanding both road and river with its arrow slits, murder holes, and portcullises. It had taken the phrase three generations to complete their bridge. When they were done, they'd thrown up stout timber keeps on either side so no one might cross without their leave. The timber had long since given way to stone. The twins, two squat, ugly, formidable castles, identical in every respect, with the bridge arching between, had guarded the had guarded the crossing for centuries. High curtain walls, deep moats, and heavy oak and iron gates protected the approaches. The bridge's footings rose from within stout inner keeps, and there was a barbaric and portcullis on either bank, and the water tower defended the span itself. We get a very distinct description of the twins. And what does this really show? It really shows this is not a castle you want to try and assault. Because even when you think about sieging, it's something we're going to talk about in the discussions a little bit about what to do with the twins, is you can't really siege it. Because you need to be on both sides of the river because they can still get in force, or they can still get in supplies from the other side. And so the thing is, if you can already get to the other side of the river, a lot of the times you won't be needing to siege the twins unless they're just in open rebellion or something. So it shows how smart the twins is, or the phrase specifically, and how they developed their castle and their way of life. And so, yes, it is very opportunistic. It's very greedy. It doesn't give you the best morality or ethics because, again, you're taking a bunch of tolls for people to cross your river and stuff. But 
you understand why the phrase do this. And but it also gives you a great representation of again the murder holes, the the arrow slits. This is a very highly defensible position, and Catelyn knows that, right? One glance, and she knew the castle was to. Again, she knew within one glance that the castle was enough to know it would not be assaulted. There were spearmen and swordmen everywhere, archers in every slit in the towers and walls, and scorpions. Lord Karstark curses the phrase, and Roos and his convoys tells them this cannot be assaulted. Again, what does this tell us, though? If this can't be assaulted, what do we do? Right? Helm and Talhart agrees they cannot siege it, as I talked about earlier, because they have no force on the other side. You can't siege it. You can't attack it head on. What is there left? Negotiation? Fall back? Or surrender? So again, it's not looking great for Rob in this moment. Another huge obstacle he will have to overcome. But as the Northmen studied the castle, a plank bridge sprung up, letting some of the frays come forth. The party was led by four of Walder for of Walder's sons, notably his heir, Stevron Frey. Catelyn notes how they all looked like weasels, but Stevron was in his 60s with grandsons of his own. But he spoke kindly enough, asking who was leading this host. But let's, before we continue with that, let's think about how they're described. Like, right away, we're kind of given this description that the Freys are not the most brave people. They're kind of a little bit villainous, looking like weasels. But something else even more to consider here is, like, Devron is in his 60s and is still the heir. It just tells you how long Walder Frey has survived and something that will continue on with the story as we get into uh, with the Freys and their kind of inner fighting and all of that. But Rob proudly says that he is leading this army, looking splendid with his stark armor. Stevron seems to size him up. Again, just like we talked about again with Rob trying to get respect from the Northern Lords, Stevron seems amused by this, that he's just some kid once again. But Stevron, I don't think Stevron is really thinking about this rationally. Think about who is behind Rob at this point. If Rob has gotten Roos Bolton, the great John Umber, to back him, it tells you a little bit about Rob in and of itself. But also, at this time, we also see Grey Wind at his side, giving Rob this presence of a little bit more unease and mystery in Stevron's eyes. He says his lord father would be honored if you would come and share meat and mead with him in his castle to discuss his purpose. And obviously, this is a horrible idea. Like, why would Rob do this alone? It doesn't make any sense. Because Walder could easily capture him, ransom him, do whatever, you know, they want to do. And the Northern Lords are already appalled to hear this because they know exactly what that means, right? Galbert Glover tells him Walder cannot be trusted and Roos agrees. Go in there and you're at his mercy. He can do what he likes with you. Kind of sounds a little bit sexual from Roos. I don't know why, but maybe that's my child brain. But I will say, like, yeah, I mean, what was Walder's purpose if Rob goes in? And I think the other part of it is Rob would not have been prepared for someone like Walder. Um, just given who the character of Walder is, I think he wouldn't. He would have lashed out. He would have fallen under it. And the other part of it is if Tywin came and Rob is captured by Walder Frey, Walder has a better chance of being rewarded, showing his loyalty and ending this conflict here and there. And so... That is kind of where I think Walder was at. I think Walder was in a situation where he wanted Rob to come in, one, because he could capture him and go to Tywin's side. But also, if if Rob was someone like maybe Jaehaerys, the conciliator, who seemed like someone that understood the politics and would give him a good deal, maybe Walder would also back Rob. So it was kind of like this thing where it was measuring up what Rob was or who he was as a person and what Walder Frey could gain. But obviously, this is not going to happen. And that gets into page 644. The Mannerly brothers suggest Walder either opening their gates and all sharing in his provisions or Walder coming out to meet them here, which again is much more of a logical thing. Like you both meet on, meet up um, in a neutral area. You discuss terms of whether that's going to be negotiating across the bridge or an alliance, whatever. Or you just talk like normal human beings, but that's not the way Walder's playing this, right? Because the thing is, if Walder was to let all of them come inside his castle, and even though, let's say, Walder, you know, doesn't want to do this alliance, the problem is he's already allowed them to basically cross at this time, and he's lost his defensive advantage. So, 
I think from Walder's point of view, you definitely don't want to do that option, but I think meeting on a neutral position would have probably been more beneficial to both sides, but not for Walder himself. Catelyn shared their doubts, but she knew the moment was slipping away. Again, as they continue to publicly insult Stevron, they're saying this all to his face, right? Which is a really bad look as well. Now, it was a really bad suggestion, but come on, you're basically insulting the guy to his face. What do you think they're going to do? And she says that she will go instead. And I think this is a perfect move, right? I think Callan is extremely smart. She is putting herself in a very dangerous position here. But think about what she can represent. She can represent Rob's best interest, someone that Rob can completely can trust. But at the same time, capturing Catelyn, if you're Walder, doesn't really give you a lot of leverage. It doesn't really do much for you. Like maybe you can ransom her, but again like it doesn't really give you much and so i really love this idea that catlin's the one that negotiates even though i don't love the terms that she ends up getting i think her being the one to go in makes the most sense the great john and rob are surprised by this but cat lies saying that she is sure of it and that walder has known her since she was a girl and would never harm her again very ironic given what happens later but it's an okay rationale but she leaves again unspoken unless there was a prophet in it. Again, she realizes that Walder would kill her if there was a prophet in it. But I think she realizes here there's not really that much of a prophet here. Like her being killed or captured doesn't really gain Walder much. Stevron accepts this and says that his father would be pleased to honor her as a guest. And for safe conduct, the younger of the four, Sir Perwin, will stay with them. Sir Perwin will be somewhat somewhat important. Sir Perwin being one of the most respectable of the phrase, and one of the ones we like the most of them. But Rob says he will be honored guest, and he requires his mother back by nightfall. He does not plan to stay long. At this, Catelyn spurned her horse towards the castle, not looking back, and she thinks about how her father had mentioned Walder Frey was the only lord who could form an army under his breeches. But now she understood that. When she was introduced at the hall at the Eastern Castle, he had 20 sons in attendance, 36 grandsons, 19 great-grandsons, and numerous other daughters and granddaughters, all that. A very big family, and you kind of understand why, as Walder Frey is still breeding at his old age. I wanted to give a quote as we're introducing to Walder Frey for the first time. Lord Walter was 90, a wizened pink weasel with a bald spotted head, too gouty to stand unassisted. His newest wife, a pale fray girl of 16 years, walked beside his litter when they carried him in. She was the eighth Lady Frey. Again, it doesn't point Walder Frey as being the most uh, heroic type, as he's super old, he seems overweight, he's got again that, that weasel look of the Freys, he is someone that uh, does not seem the most respectable type of guy, and we will definitely see that as we go forward. But Catelyn starts trying to play the nice political game. He says it is nice to see him again, but we already see who Walder Frey is, as he squints suspiciously at her and doubts that, and asks if his son is too proud to come to see him herself. Or see him himself. Again, reflecting on why Rob didn't come and not Catelyn. And Walder Frey instantly thinks he asks what he has to do with her. Again, because Walder Frey is thinking about what he can gain from like a prisoner or something like that. And he really isn't coming up with anything he could do with Catelyn, which is why it's genius that Catelyn was the one that came. And the last time she had seen Walder, she had been a girl. But even then, he was sharp of tongue and age had not made it any better. She must be careful with her words. Again, doesn't want to offend Walder, something Rob's going to do. She wants to get out of this as best as possible. And so right now, you're in a tough situation because Walder's someone that doesn't take bullshit. He doesn't like this, oh, courtesy game. He wants to get straight to the point. Stevron tries to make up for this, saying that Catelyn is an honored guest by his invitation. But Walder, but Walder fires back, saying he isn't the Lord yet. He Does he look dead? Again, it really shows you the dynamic between Walder and House Frey. But it also shows like that Stevron is willing to be someone that, you know, is a little bit more courtesy, right? And that thing that's very weird. That doesn't really translate to certain Freys, and other Freys it definitely does. Another of his sons sparks up, saying this was no way to talk to Catelyn. But Walder again shuts him down, saying now his bastard is preaching at him. He notes how he has feasted three kings. He does not need to take advice from them as he asks for assistance to share. Again, 
fascinating thinking about how old Walder has been that he has lived through the last few kings very interesting when you think about it they shifted Walder from his litter to the throne of the twins described as a tall black oak chair on the back having two towers connected by a bridge reflecting their castle the twins and I really think this is a cool throne I feel like I've been glazing um the tw the phrase quite a lot in this um chapter but I can't help it they have a cool castle like, they have a cool throne. I understand a lot of their motivations quite a lot. They're not like these, like, just, oh, they're just straight up the bad guys. Like, I can understand their rationale. We don't, I don't like the phrase. Let's get that straight. But they're quite interesting, and you can't deny that. But Walder then does kiss her hand and says they're now, and says that now all the pleasantries have been done. Again, shows he has a lack of care for these things. Again, more foreshadowing to other pleasantries or things that he will break, like the right of hospitality. He then hopes his son will do them the honor of shutting their mouths and asks what she wants, again, getting straight to the point. She says to open his gates and that Rob and his bannermen are anxious to cross and be on their way. Again, she doesn't even ask for an alliance from the phrase, right? She just wants to cross. She starts out pretty simple, right? It's pretty simple in terms of just, we want to cross, that's it. Walder instantly picks up on what they want, though. So they can go to River Run as he as he laughs. No need to tell him that. Again, Walder understands what the plan is, and he's not an idiot. But something else I find interesting is if you're Walder and you're sitting here in the situation. Again, we know this is the Starks, so they wouldn't do this. But if Walder was to just open his gates, what's to say the Starks don't take control of the castle and threaten Walder to have an alliance? Like you got to think about that, right? Like. Right now, the Freys have an advantage because they have a defensible position, but once you let all this Stark force through these gates and through your bridge, now they have a position in which they can threaten you, right? They have five times as many men as you do. They could take your castle under sword point very quickly. So, again, there is a lot of risk there for Walder that he kind of needs some sort of assurance that, that wouldn't happen, even though, once again, we know it's the Starks, so they wouldn't do that. But, you know, it is interesting to ponder. And that gets us into page 646. But Walder, Frey, but Walder Frey says he is not blind and can read a map. And again, Cat sees no reason to deny it. It's pretty obvious where they're going. The obvious place, if you're trying to go south and you're going this way, is to help River Run under siege. But Catelyn tries to do her own verbal sparring, as she had figured to see him there, as he is still their bannerman. Again, just Poking the bear a little bit, you know, why aren't you helping the Tullys already? Why are we even having this meeting? Walder does his famous, heh, or he, however you, however you want to, like, pronounce that, but says he was planning to march when he had his full strength, and asks Jared to confirm this, given he is not capable of, ar of marching anymore, and Jared says, on his honor, that was the intent. Again, the honor of a fray. And who knows when their full strength was going to be? A generation from now when they have more kids? It's one of those things where Walder, again, was waiting and all of that. But it's Walder having an excuse to play the waiting game, right? It's always have an excuse. Something that's like, oh yeah, you know, I was waiting for all of my soldiers that I could possibly get so I could help Edmure type situation. Where it's like... You're not going to publicly call him out, but you get the undertones of what's going on here. But Walder goes a step forward and I think is makes a very interesting comment. Walder then adds, it is his. Walder then adds, is it his fault that Edmure went and lost the battle before he could arrive? Which is an interesting comment. Like Edmure not only tried to make battle with Jamie, who had probably a larger force at the time, better manned and or trained. And he took the fight. He didn't you know, try and stall or at least pull his army back to maintain his strength so that when Rob comes south, which he knew was probably going to happen, the north would back them, then you could have some sort of attack. So in a lot of ways, Walder is kind of right. Edmure took a battle that he shouldn't have. And Walder goes even further. Why should he send his men south to die? Everyone that went south is now fleeing north. Again, at this point, it's too late, right? Walder Frey is sending, what, 4,000. He's not even going to send that with Rob's campaign. He's going to send, like, what, 3,500 around there because you have to have some men to garrison the castle. It's not enough to break Jamie's host. So at this point, there's no real reason to march unless he's marching with Rob. And so you look at a lot of this and you go, yeah, you can understand in Walder's position why he's playing the waiting game. The Lannisters, 
right now are like two to one odds against all of the Riverland forces at this point. Doesn't really make sense for Walder to pick that fight and get his people killed. And even though he's not, again, thinking about it as people, he's really thinking about his own personal benefit. But something that we will see is kind of a common theme, and we'll see this as a common theme throughout the story, right? People trying to flee war and the conflict going on. But Catelyn isn't really able to respond the way she would like, right? This is not good. It's just trading insults, and Catelyn is kind of starting to get angry by this. The way Walder's insinuating that Edmure is an idiot and his reluctance to help. But she was smarter than all of that, and asked calmly where they can go to talk. Again, she wants to talk privately, and Walder Frey, being as funny as ever, says one of the funniest lines, we are talking right now. But again, Walder Frey gets them to leave, and he notes how Stevron has been waiting 40 years for him to die, but why should he die so that he can become a lord? He won't do it. Again, it tells... A lot about Walder Frey. He's stubborn and he likes power. He doesn't like giving satisfaction to people in his family that he knows are waiting for him to die. He's a very much a pessimist or even a realist, I guess, to a degree. But Catelyn, trying to again appease him and not make him angry, says she hopes he lives to 100. And Walder is amused by that, saying that we'll surely hate that. Again, referencing all the Freys that want to get rid of him, more or less. But he asks what she wants, and Catelyn notes to cross. And that gets into page 647. Walder says, Why should I let you? And Walder says, Why should I let you? And anger rushed to Catelyn, and she goes for a threat, telling him to look out that window as there are 20,000 men outside his walls. And again, this is emotion getting to Catelyn, right? She doesn't think about what she's saying here because. We've already had this conversation, right? This is an empty threat that Catelyn is trying to tell Walder that, oh yeah, we have all these men and we outnumber you, you know, five to one, but they have a defensible position. Also, you're a captive right now, so saying those things, probably not the best idea, but Walder notes this, right? He says, 20,000 corpses when Tywin gets here. Don't try to frighten him, right? Walder Frey is correct. There is not really a situation in which Walder kind of loses. If if the Starks attack, they will lose tons of men, even if they win, right? Let's say the Starks and Rob win this battle. They would lose all of their men, and or at least a good amount of them to where they'd be weakened and would eventually lose anyway. So Walder's in a situation where he can't really lose in terms of his actual castle or his well-being, I guess. But Walder continues saying he surely does not fear Rob, and Walder himself had more sons than hers, or than her, and his will outlive hers. Interesting idea, given that Rob will die to the phrase, and also that it is believed that Rickon and Bran are dead by Catelyn when it comes to book three. So it's actually an interesting line that Catelyn will kind of actually think is true by the end of her uh, actual story. And by actual story, I mean Catelyn, not Lady Stoneheart. Catelyn notes that he swore an oath, but he once again throws it right back at her, saying... He said some words, but he also said some to the king. It kind of gets back to that whole point of what oath do you really follow and how close do you hold to those oaths? Because now Joffrey is the king. He's the one that sits the Iron Throne. By all the laws of men, you are traitors. If he had any sense, he would help the Lannisters. And again, even think about it if, you know, Walder Frey was somebody that was more honorable to his oaths. He doesn't know what we, the audience, know, right? That Joffrey is not actually the person that should be on the throne. It should be Stannis. And that Joffrey's an idiot and all this stuff. Joffrey is the person on the throne. And that gives him legitimacy. That's something that we're going to see quite a lot when it comes to a lot of civil wars. For instance, for instance, House of the Dragon or the Dance of the Dragons, Aegon II having the throne at the beginning of the war gives him a lot of legitimacy over Rhaenyra, and that's something that's very key to understanding in terms of politics. But also, you know, if he had any sense, he would help the Lannisters, right? That doesn't say that he's going to help the Lannisters. It's leaving the door open, and that's what Catelyn kind of needs to hear. But this is very telling, given that Walder is willing to switch sides. He's willing to get what will get him the most out of that. That's very telling for the Red Wedding and what will happen later on. Cat challenges him, asking why doesn't he? And Walder notes what a fine man Tywin is with his gold, everything, and his power. And Walder's clearly jealous of him. Tywin has all this prestige and he has all this wealth. He's just clearly way above Walder's um, class. And so Walder's jealous of that. Walder is jealous of people that have power. For instance, Hoster Tully as well. 
but he sees Tywin as even worse than the Tullys and the Starks. If Tywin wanted to, or if Tywin wants, if Tywin wants his help, he can bloody ask. Interesting, given what happens later. Again, I just feel like there's a lot of on the nose foreshadowing for later that George puts here, given he knew what could happen with these characters later on. And this is all Kala needs to know, right? She now knows that Walder is willing to actually make some sort of agreement, but she's going to have to work towards it and give things up, or more specifically, Rob will have to give things up. She states as a mother, she is asking with her family's voice for help. Again, once again, very interesting, given Callan's last words, trying to save Rob, and she'll use a very similar argument that doesn't work here, and it didn't work then either. Just more of that foreshadowing. Walder tells her to save her sweet words. He gets enough from his daughter, who is freshly flowered, and will give him a son by next year. And hell, maybe he will name them the heir instead of... Instead, that will boil the pot quite nicely. Again, kind of disgusting, given that Walder is so old and he's still, like, having sex with really young women. Very weird. There's not really anything else that needs to be said. That gets us into page 648. And Catelyn is certain that she will give him. And Catelyn is certain that she will give him many sons. Again, just trying to make him happy. But Walder is not pleased as he notes how Hoster did not come to his wedding or the last one. And it's one of those things where Walder Frey feels quite slighted. And I think it's Walder Frey just being prickly, just being annoyed that he is not as powerful as someone like Hoster Tully or can command as many troops or wealth. Because when you think about it. Do you really expect Hoster Tully to go to, like, every single different wedding of his bannermen? I mean, especially when you look at Walder when he's had so many, it doesn't really seem feasible to me that Hoster would make it to every single one. But we also get why that Lord... We also know that Walder Frey had gotten the nickname the late Lord Frey because of Hoster Tully and Walder Frey showing up late to... the to the Battle of the Trident, because he was going to pick whichever side was winning. But he promises that he is not dead and will outlive him, just like he had did, just like he did his father. Again, just talking about her Hoster and his father, because Walder is very old at this point. Something very unnatural. When you think about this world with not great medical care, constant warring, the fact that Walder Frey has lived this long is Kind of a testament to how he lives in a lot of ways. He doesn't put himself in harm's way often, whereas many men in this world do. He notes how her house is always pissed on his, as even once he had tried to make a match for Edmure with one of his daughters, and Hoster had spurned this. Now, I do believe, right, that Walder Frey has some legitimate criticisms of the Tullys. The Tullys do look down on the Freys. I think a lot of the Riverlords do because of their demeanor, the way... Um, they kind of hold themselves, but at the same time, the Tullys don't help themselves, right? I think the manner in which they do things doesn't exactly help. But at the same time, are you supposed to have Hoster marry the heir to River Run to a Frey girl? Doesn't really seem like the best thing in the world. But if you also are thinking about it from the opposite side, if you are the Tullys and you think about all your bannermen, they seem all relatively loyal to you the one that kind of sticks out as the least loyal to you is the phrase marrying into the phrase with edmure is not a terrible idea as well as the phrase are extremely powerful four thousand men is a very sizable for just one bannerman it's not a terrible move right so you know i can see both sides with walder and hoster here but i i do you know kind of side with hoster and why he doesn't want to med or wed edmure to her or to them. Walder continues stating how her sister was worse as they went to a tourney in King's Landing and the phrase were shamed as his, hor as, as his sons did horribly. But the real point was is that Walder tried to get John Aaron to foster two of his grandsons at court and even offered to foster Robin. Now, this, of course, wasn't going to happen. Could you imagine giving the heir to the Vale, the heir to the Eyrie, to Walder Frey to foster? That would be the last person that I would foster my kid with, and let alone the heir. And so you understand why that is turned down. Now, the other thing about this is like having two Freys as, you know, like foster kids at the Capitol. That doesn't seem like a bad idea, right? 
That one, I'm just like, you know, because you don't need to do too much, right? You think about the Frey boys that are going to go north. There's not a lot you really have to do. And so that part of it, I can understand why Walder Frey is a little bit upset. But the funny and interesting part here is that Lysa grew colder. And we know why, right? She didn't want anybody fostering her son. She didn't want to be parted by her son. But we once again have some conflicting information that Catelyn's going to learn. We already heard, again, in Catelyn's um, second to last chapter, not this chapter, but the one before that, but not in Catelyn two chapters ago, not in this chapter, the chapter before, but the chapter before that, when she was still in the Eyrie, she knows, right, that she got some information from the Maester that Jon Aaron was planning to foster Robin Aaron with Stannis of Dragonstone. And Walder Frey backs that up. So this is, okay, very contradictory. Callan had been told by Lysa that Rob Nero was to be fostered by the Lannisters. That's what kind of kick-started a lot of what was going on. And so now you're sitting here, you're going, huh, if you're a reader, this is brought up a second time. Almost to emphasize this information, and we might not know why at this point, but it's something that makes you feel very stupid when we get to it later on in the story. And that gets us into page 649. Catelyn questions this, but Walder, sure, he knows the difference between the two. But Walder asks her about warning or wanting to cross and says they do. But Walder says they can't without his approval and sits back smirking. At this, they haggled over the terms, which are off screen, unfortunately. Now, this is where I think is quite interesting. I don't know why George decided to do this. Like, he skips this whole phase of them ironing out the details and just tells it to Rob. Like, we're basically with Rob and trying to figure out what the details are, and so I think it's an interesting decision. I don't hate it by George. I understand why he did it, because this chapter's already pretty long. In terms of the first book, this is a relatively long chapter, so I can understand why he did it, because you would have needed probably at least a page or two um, to get that done, but I did find that interesting. Um, also, I did want to go back, because I kind of was vague about it, but when Walder's talking about the difference between the two, he was talking about fostering Rob and Aaron at uh, either with Tywin or Stannis, um, and just talking about the difference between the two, I just want to bring that up because it's kind of vague in my notes when I put that down, but this happens off screen, and so let's get to her returning to the camp. So she returns to the camp with some of his sons at her back, Walder Frey's sons, uh, to be exact, and a rank of pikemen, but she says he has the crossing. It just gets us into page 650, where we'll learn the details, and to Rob's Maybe not so satisfaction. But not only does he have the crossing, he also has the men as well. But he is going to leave, or Walder Frey is going to leave 400 men here to hold it, and Catelyn believes that Rob should also mix 400 of his own men under a commander he trusts to make sure Walder keeps faith. I think this is a very smart move from Wall from I think this is a very smart move from Catelyn as well, given that this is their transportation if they need to retreat. If it's blocked off against them, not a good sign. So just having a force that matches what's the garrison there that are loyal to you, uh, very important. I think that's a very smart move from Catelyn. But Ra Rob suggests Helm and Talhart as he gazes at the men following her and Cat agrees on the decision. Rob asks what was required of them. And this is where we get to some questionable things. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on this deal. But firstly, she will need men for two boys of eight and seven, both named Walder, to be to be escorted north as they will be her wards. These are the Walders we will see with Ramsay. And uh, not the best uh, of kids. But second, his son uh, Oliver is to come with them and be Rob's personal squire to be knighted when appropriate. Again, one of the more liked um, phrase and someone that becomes a good companion to Rob. Rob tries to cut in saying fine, but he's cut off again, as Catelyn is not done. Thirdly, if Arya is found, she is to wed his youngest son, Elmar, when they come of age. Rob notes that Arya won't like that one bit, but Catelyn continues stating he will have to marry one of her daughters when the war is over. He has the right to pick any. And she is proud to see he doesn't flinch from this, but at the same time, in my opinion, I don't know how I feel about these negotiating skills. Given that, <clears throat> given that Walder Frey only commands 4,000 men, yes, he has a crossing that's very vital to Rob's campaign at this point. It's quite weird. You sacrifice Rob, the Warden of the North, presumably, going forward, the Controller of the North. That's a very big, powerful person. 
And so you sit here and you go, huh. Not only does Rob have to marry into the phrase, but also Arya. Now, we understand why Arya isn't enough, because we don't know where Arya is. And the more time that passes that she's not found, it's more likely that she's dead. So, you're sitting here and you're going, okay, what can you promise Walder? And this is where I, I, I've kind of changed my mind a bit on this, because I used to think this was a like terrible negotiating. But, in reality, what could Catelyn have gotten from, what could Catelyn have done with Walder? Walder definitely seems like he was going for a heavy power play, which he does do. But, what could she have offered? Bran is a cripple. Walder Frey wouldn't want that. Because, also, we know that Bran can't reproduce anyway, so that wouldn't have worked. Rickon is still a kid, so you could have offered Rickon. But Rickon is the third son, the youngest of the house. It's not as big of a power play for Walder then. Like, it's still tying the families together. But it's not as, like, crucial. Could you have tied Sansa to them? Maybe, but she's a prisoner of war and she's betrothed to Joffrey. So again, you're, like, a little bit higher than Arya, as in you know that Sansa's alive. But there's a lot of problems that come with that. So you're sitting here and you're going, and I look at this and I go, I don't know really what Talon could have done besides this. And so that's where I'm sitting here and I'm like, it's not a good deal because the Starks definitely get the raw end of the deal. Given that I think both sides had their own leverages, I don't think it was as much in favor of the phrase having all the leverage. Like, as I've talked about, right? Let's talk about the leverages both sides real quick, just to remind you guys from earlier. But the leverage that Walder Frey has is that without this crossing, the Starks will die. They will, they will be killed. But on the other side of it, if you're Rob's camp, you're thinking here going, Okay, but if you don't help us, if we don't make some sort of alliance here, you get nothing. Tywin's going to come here and get all the glory, and you're going to get nothing. You might, maybe you'll get a nice slap on the back, or a nice job type thing, or whatever, but you're not going to get anything out of it. And so, they both had leverage. It just didn't really go the right way in terms of the Starks. Now, maybe what else could have been done is Catelyn instead tells... Walder that Edmure would also marry um, the phrase, which is what ends up happening at the Red Wedding. That could have helped, but again, also Edmure is a captive, so you kind of see like everything going on in Catelyn's mind. Like she doesn't have a lot of pieces to play with, and that's the biggest issue I think she ran into. And so I'm kind of left at a weird position. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on this deal, but it does seem like the phrase are getting a lot out of it. Alan asks if he consents, and Rob asks, does he have a choice? And she responds, not if you want to cross. And at this, he, then he consents solemnly, as it took a real man to agree to a marriage pact, knowing what it meant. And to this, I agree. Think about Rob's position here. He is someone that's only 15. He's really young. He hasn't had, like, a first relationship or any of these things. And he's having to make a marriage pact with a woman he doesn't know. He doesn't know who he's... He doesn't know if any of these people he's even going to be attracted to. Let alone if they match his person. Let alone if they match him as an individual. And this is for life, right? Marriage is taken very seriously in Westeros. You can't break that. That's a huge commitment to make to try and help your father and your family. It's a really big move for Rob to just take it on the lip and keep moving. Now, we know he's not going to hold to this oath, but the fact that he even made it, knowing his morality and knowing um, his ethics and his code that Ned has put into him, it's a really big agreement. And so I think it's an, a nice little place that we end this chapter on. But getting to the last page, they cross at Evenfall as they pass through the Eastern Castle onto the bridge to depart through the Western Castle. Cat was at the head of the column with her uncle and Stevron Frey. It would take hours for them to cross. Again, it just shows you how mighty Rob's host is, just taking hours for men to cross this bridge, let alone, you know, their supplies, food, armor, all these camp followers that maybe are with you. It's going to take a long time. But she remembers seeing Walder's gleam as they passed the murder holes. Again, Walder Frey knows he's just gotten in crazy deal. Like, his power just went up a ton, especially if Rob does well in this campaign. It is still a very risky move for Walder, but he does make it. And at this, 
Catelyn notes that nine out of ten of their mounted came through, but their foot remained under the command of Roose Bolton to continue south to meet Tywin for good or ill. Rob had thrown his dice. Yeah, this is the point now of the story. There's no turning back, right? Rob cannot retreat and go back to Moat Kaelin and try a defensive war or Bethany. This is the point now. You've made your decision. Men are going to die. You could lose this. This could mean really the end of their lives. And so the stakes, I think, were not really brought up in this chapter as they were in like the last Catelyn chapter, but it continues to build that rising conflict for what we're going to see between um, the Lannisters and Starks in this first book. And just another fantastic chapter. I, I Again, for you guys that have been longtime viewers of the channel, or maybe you've gone back and watched older videos and things, you guys know the Red Wedding is my favorite chapter. And chapters like this are the reason that chapter is so good. Knowing all of this work that George put into years before the Red Wedding chapter even happens, in terms of when he was writing this and then when it came out, it's an amazing piece of work and arts that I, I think this chapter really helps make that chapter so good. But thank you guys all for watching. I hope you guys all did not get annoyed by my change of clothing and stuff. This was three different um, recording sessions, but yeah, a long one. I hope you guys all enjoyed, and I'll see you guys back in the next one, which we'll be doing Jon Snow.